Welcome to Majoring in the Majors with Pastor S.J. Munson on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available as podcasts. You can find them at artistfirst.com. Your host is the author of two books, The Treasure of Israel and Christ Held Hostage, The Hijacking of American Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Pastor S.J. Munson. Hi, this is S.J. Munson, and welcome to Majoring in the Majors. Almost two weeks ago, um, Vladimir Putin shocked the world by invading neighboring Ukraine. Uh, The invasion has been particularly alarming because of its ferocity and the possibility of its its spilling over into a wider East-West conflict. Um, Who or what has been responsible for now what what is rapidly becoming a humanitarian tragedy? And here to talk about the invasion and the background behind it is, is Dr. Paul Danieri, um, he is the professor of political science and public policy at the University of California, Riverside, and his research examines international politics in the post-Soviet region, focusing partic- particularly on Ukraine and Russia. His book, Ukraine and Russia, From Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War, traces the roots of the conflict and I think is, uh, and many people are saying, is required reading for anyone seeking to better understand what is happening and what is unfolding before us. Um, Dr. Danieri, thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. This, this whole uh, area of, of, of Russian-Ukrainian studies is, is, is fascinating. How did, you, how did you get interested in Russian-Ukrainian politics in specific? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I went to university in the sort of late days of the Cold War, and like a lot of people, was interested in U.S.-Soviet relations. In in part, I was I was interested in this idea that we might blow up the planet. Um, you know, arms control, nuclear weapons, all that. And um, and uh, so so that's how I got into it. Was this idea that it was the most important question in international politics, but. Um, just as I, I finished writing my dissertation in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and I looked around and I thought, Ooh, the, you know, Russia and Ukraine, the two biggest republics. Uh, Russia, Russia seems to have this idea that Ukraine shouldn't go too far away. Uh, the Ukrainians are saying they, they want to head straight towards Western Europe. This looks like it's going to be tricky. And uh, so I started studying the, the relationship really almost as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, and unfortunately... It's continued to be uh, a very important uh, relationship. So I've kept that yes. for 30-something years now. Well, we're grateful that you have, and that you're here to, to, to help us to, to unlock the, the mysteries of what's going on. Um, so at first, I think it's, it's important to look at that relationship between the two countries from the point of view of history, and of course, mm-hmm. how that relationship changed after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as you said, in, in 1991. Can you outline that, that history for us? I know that's a big question, but, but please, uh, we have the time if you want. Sure, you want to sure. Um, I'm going to give you a very short version, and if you want me to dig into some more detail, then I'll do it. But um, okay. you know, both uh, contemporary Russia and contemporary Ukraine uh, trace their roots, and this is all a bit, of course, mythological, but trace their roots to the medieval state of Kiev and Rus. Um, and Kiev and Rus is so important. It's in, it was in what is currently uh, Kiev, and it's why you've got you know, thousand-year-old churches in Kiev that are just spectacular to look at if you ever get the chance, if they don't get blown up. But um, mm-hmm. it, was in, it was in Rus, uh, Rus uh, and, and Kiev was kind of the major uh, power in this region in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. And, um, and in 988 A.D., uh, 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 basically at that point, a Viking prince named Valdemar, who ruled Kiev, um, was baptized into Christianity and became uh, Volodymyr, if you're, if you're speaking Ukrainian, or Vladimir, if you're speaking Russian. And essentially, the, when, the, when, the Mos- when Muscovy, which later became Russia, sort of arose 400 years later, uh, partly in order to justify their rule, um, but partly because there was a notion at the time that political rule and religious rule should be unified, they claimed that legacy. They said, we are the heirs to um, Kiev and Rus. And so um, it, it, through all the years, it justified um, Russian expansion, and, um, and, and Russia did expand westward to, to take much of the territory that is currently Ukraine over the centuries. So Russia has this narrative of uh, 
Ukraine and Russia have been one, and we trace our roots back to this key evidence. Um, the Ukrainians have a very different story of the same history, which is to say Russia was this thing that arose out of the rubble of the, of the um, Golden Horde, the Mongol invasion of this area, uh, several hundred years later, and it's a different thing. And all those years that Russia was ruling Ukraine has really been colonization, not brotherly love. Um, mm. And that is a very short version of a thousand years of history. I will simply say that um, the leader of, of Ukraine today, the president, is Volodymyr Zelensky. And the president of Russia is Vladimir Putin. They both have the same name or different Slavicizations of the name of this same medieval prince that baptized uh um, the key Evans, uh, Amas, in 988. That's really uh, symbolic, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it is. I mean, you don't want to read too much into these things. Um, but the fact that Vladimir Volodymyr is such a popular name in the region, you know, I think stems from that time. Mm, yeah. Now, why, why is the timing of this invasion? Why is this happening now of all times? Yeah, that's a good question, um, because it's been developing. I mean, I gave you the thousand years of, of history in whatever, three minutes. You know, we could talk about Russia under Peter the Great. We could talk about Russia under Catherine the Great um, and various people in between. We could go up to the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Stalin um, uh, uh, before that, and, and so on. But um, why it's happening now, I think there are there are two things. And I want to say we didn't exactly anticipate this. Um but it, it, it seems to be happening now, I think, because Putin seems to have decided that, that time was working against him. And I think there were a couple different dimensions to that. One is that after the invasion of 2014, in which uh, Russia invaded eastern Ukraine and Crimea, um, he, I think he thought that this was going to bring the Ukrainians around, and that occupation of eastern, Crimea, of eastern Ukraine in particular was going to force uh, Ukraine to accede to a version of the Minsk Agreements that would sort of put Ukraine at least partly under Russia's thumb. That wasn't happening. And not only wasn't that happening, but the Ukrainian people um, reacted against those attacks in 2014 by clearly um, renewing and, and strengthening their desire to really um, integrate with Western Europe, not with Russia. Um, a second factor is, is um, there was a new Ukrainian president elected in 2019, this, this President Zelensky, and I think Putin and a lot of Ukrainians actually thought and feared that he was going to make a deal with Russia. Well, that was not happening. So on the one hand, I think the things he thought that were going to solve this problem weren't solving it. Um, but then there were things that, made, that were getting worse. The Ukrainians were, were redoubling their efforts to join up with Western Europe. And within Ukraine, uh, Zelensky in 2021 uh, arrested uh, basically, or I shouldn't say Zelensky arrested him, but the Ukrainian authorities arrested uh, one of Putin's, or I should say Putin's biggest ally in Ukraine, a guy named Viktor Medvedchuk, on treason charges and had closed down some media outlets that this guy Medvedchuk and some others had bought uh, using Russian money, but sort of, you know, through shell companies. And so I think there was this idea that, that Russia's and Putin's position in Ukraine was ebbing away. And then the last thing I'll point to, which has to be a matter of speculation, which is uh, Putin turned 70 this year, and it seems that perhaps he has a notion that bringing Russia back in is his historical mission and that, uh, you know, that there was not an infinite, amount, an infinite amount of time for him to do this. Mm. Oh. Now, in, in the West, we're always looking for someone to blame, you know, for these, these conflicts. I think it's, it's sort of comforting to, for us to know that we can control these things. You know? Yeah, um, yep. And some experts are blaming the invasion on the U.S. and the expansion of NATO. This is a reaction to the uh, expansion of NATO. Um, is that true, or is this one of many reasons? Um, can you uh, weigh in on that? What was the role I, I can. of the West? I can. Um, historically, it's just, I think, wrong, if, if, if wrong is too, maybe perhaps too simple a word. Um, but there's, there's not much doubt that uh, NATO expansion irritated uh, Putin and the Russian elite. Um, but it, it's not by itself a cause, and it's a long way from that. And let me explain. Uh, the, mo the most significant point, and I document this pretty in, you know, with quotations and footnotes and the whole bit in the book, is that Russian claims on Ukraine uh, began as the Soviet Union was collapsing, after it had collapsed, 
and and continuously up until now. Um, but the key point being, they started uh, and were very intense well before there was any conversation about uh, or any serious conversation about NATO enlargement. So NATO enlargement can't have caused Russian claims on Ukraine uh, because the claims were, were already there. They predated it by years. Um, that that being said, uh, there's no doubt that the expansion of Ukraine um, irritated Russia. Um, and there were those at the time who predicted this and said it's a reason not to do it. It's equally the case that NATO expansion was in part a reaction to things that were going on in Russia and that Russia was doing. It was also in part a reaction to what was going on in Yugoslavia, uh, and it was in part uh, a reaction simply to uh, the desire to uh, embed some of the um, newly democratizing states in Eastern Europe into Western institutions, and NATO was really the easiest one to expand, much less difficult to expand NATO than the European Union. So, yes, it irritated the Russians. No, I don't think it can really um, be seen as a cause. Um, and even to the extent that it irritated them, we should be clear, there are a lot of things that Russia could do besides invading Ukraine. Um, and, of course, for many years it didn't invade Ukraine. So, yeah. It may have been a great decision. It may have been an unwise decision, but it wasn't a cause in um, any conventional sense of that word. Is there is there anything going on here in terms of our political situation here in the United States that that might have precipitated the timing of this this event? Yeah, this well, this I think I assume what you're getting at is this, this question of, of whether you know Biden becoming president um, had an impact. Uh, I there's that's speculative, but a lot of what we're doing is speculating. Um, there is some speculation to that effect, and I will put it this way: I'm um, certainly given the. Um, uh, unceremonious and chaotic way that we exited Afghanistan in uh, the summer of 2021, um, you know, it, it might well have contributed to the notion in um, in Russia that the United States would have a limited response to this. And of course, even before the invasion, but in the run-up to it, uh, President Biden had said the United States isn't going to put boots on the ground in Ukraine, a, a position he still holds to. And there are those who think that that might have in, encouraged him um, as well. I, I think mm. what we can see, of course, is that Putin's determination, Russia's determination to conquer Ukraine is very, very high, given the cost it's now, it's now bearing to do that. And so given, those, given the determination that they seem to have, um, relatively minor nuances in, in the language of the American president, I, I doubt are a, a factor that sort of swung him from one side to the other. Uh, I, would, I would raise one other point, which is I think the more important leadership change that potentially um, might explain some of the timing was the departure, the retirement uh, of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who was mm. um, seen as a very strong leader um, and, and had a lot of prestige, not only in Germany, but in Europe and around the world, and I think was generally seen as a, as a formidable figure um, and an effective leader. And, and, uh, and, and of a party that, te that was a conservative party. And I think there's a sense that, there was a sense that um, she might have reacted very strongly to this. And with a new chancellor, Olaf Scholz, rel uh, basically untested in foreign policy and from a party and with a, a personal record of advocating very um, peaceful relations with Russia, let's say, basically thinking the, the strategy is to engage Russia, not to confront it, um, this might have seemed like a, a very good opportunity um, to, to, to push it. Um, interestingly enough, um, Schultz now in the, in the German Social Democratic Party has entirely embraced a complete reversal of their previous policy towards Russia and is embracing um, a significant increases in defense spending as well as shipping uh, weapons to Ukraine. So to the extent that, that Putin's uh, calculation was based on this weak leadership in um, in Germany, he seems to have, through his actions, really undone that um, and caused the exact mm -hmm. opposite of perhaps what he hoped for. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if Ukraine had joined NATO uh, before this conflict, what, what might have happened? I'm, I'm thinking particularly of uh, an example of, of Finland, for example, which uh, yep. is you know, former, formerly under the control of the Soviet Union, but yep. uh, has not joined NATO and has a thriving democracy. Um, what would it have been possible for Ukraine to remain independent without joining NATO? This is a this is a good question, and um, 
I think the answer is yes, it could have. Um, you know, when it's it, hindsight, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, more important would have been for for Ukraine to get a pathway towards membership in the European Union. Um, but as you can see, um, Russia seems it, it seems to be the case, right? Over the past thirty years since the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, Russia was not going to give up on this, and, and in particular, Putin was not going to give up on this. So I don't think we can say that Ukraine's membership in NATO would have solved all of the problems. We don't know what would have happened had Ukraine been given membership in NATO. Um, but Ukraine's uh, security problem, given Russia's aspirations, Ukraine's security problem was a tough, uh, a tough problem to solve. And uh, NATO membership might have been one way of solving it, uh, but it, made a, it, it might have led to some other problems as well, which is why uh, people were, were against it in, uh, in various parts of Western Europe. Mm. You know, the fear was the fear was that if we admit Ukraine to NATO, we will have uh, really ended the chances for a good, productive relationship with Russia. Um, now, ultimately, of course, our chances for a good, productive uh, relationship with Russia seem to be gone for years, if not decades. <laughs> um, but it's but it's not clear that the people who, who feared that NATO uh, uh, membership for Ukraine would cause that uh, could have predicted that. Mm, right. It just seems that, and I know you know very little about this this area of study, but um, I, I remember uh, Churchill's famous quote about Russia as a, a riddle wrapped in an enigma. It, it just seems that the West has a history of misunderstanding or misjudging or miscalculating what Russia is going to do. What, what, what is up with that? <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a good question. Um, I think that in the, uh, I'm not going to try to explain a general Western misperception of Russia over the centuries. Um, trying to explain it for the last 20 or 30 years might be brave enough. Um, but I think um, there has been um, a, a lot of wishful thinking about Russia. Um, and a lot of wishful thinking about Putin in particular. Um, mm. And I, I, could, I, I could tell any number of anecdotes that, that you want, but we, um, we wanted to believe that Russia was going to transform itself after 1991, and we um, ignored some of the signs that it wasn't happening, including some of the signs that came very early, very early on. We wanted to believe that we could buy oil and gas from Russia and... Um, have their have their uh, wealthy uh, oligarchs, you know, investing in our businesses and our uh, athletic teams and so on, without any negative consequences. Um, and, and so I think that's a big part of it is is sort of optimism. Um, but there has been a I would say a, a subset of people over the last thirty years who have I would say probably not misunderstood Russia that much and have not misunderstood Putin, um, and have been warning people. Um, and I don't necessarily want to say, you know, they were right and others were wrong. Um, it was very ambiguous. And I think, I think that really gets to it, which is um, Russia has itself, in some respects, deliberately been non-transparent and difficult to gauge. Putin himself, as a, you know, trained up in the Soviet KGB, I think retained um, a lot of strategic ambiguity on a lot of things. And used a lot of misinformation and misdirection. So I think it is easy to misunderstand someone when you're both very hopeful for one kind of uh, outcome and when they are um, undertaking a fair amount of effort, right, to mislead you. Hmm. Now, your um, book talks about uh, three... I, I, would, I, would add, I would add one thing if I could, which is, um, you know, I, say, I yes. say they were misleading us. I think it's also fair to say I'm not sure... I'm not sure that when Putin came to power in, in 2000 that, you know, this is where he knew things um, were going to end up. I think Russia um, is not a fixed thing. It's been changing. And so what hmm. we knew to be true in 1991 or 2001 um, might not be true today about Russia. And, and so that's another factor that makes it hard to understand. Hmm. Now, um, uh, your book talks about three underlying factors that have... Yeah exacerbated the conflict. One is, is uh, security, the security issues yep. involved yep. between the two nations. Um, another is the, the spread of uh, democracy in the region. Mm -hmm. And the third is the 
the, the general goals of the West in this uh, post-Cold War environment. Uh, can we talk about security first? What, what are the security concerns, security issues involved here? Could you go into detail about that? Yeah, yeah. So let's go, you know, go back to 1991, um, the, the, a bunch of countries in Eastern Europe that had been under the rule of Moscow um, and a very authoritarian, very repressive rule of Moscow since the end of World War II um, became free. Um, and in the meantime, a war broke out in Yugoslavia. And then in 1993, Russia itself was on the verge of civil war, and Boris Yeltsin had to use tanks to um, basically disband a parliament that was controlled by people who sort of wanted to go back to the Soviet Union. Then in December 1993, uh, after, after Putin, I'm sorry, after Yeltsin disbanded the parliament, wrote a new constitution, and held new parliamentary elections, the, um, the leading party who won the most seats in that election was basically a fascist party. Um, and, and another party that did very well was the Communist Party. So they were, it was called the Red-Brown Coalition, this sort of weird coalition of, of um, people who wanted to go back to communism and people who wanted to sort of go back to a version of Russian nationalism that sounded like fascism. Mm-hmm. And they were talking they, about all kinds of things. <laughs> Excuse me? I'm sorry. I said politics makes strange bedfellows. So strange, strange bedfellows. But what combined them was this idea um, that Russia within its current borders was too small, um, that Russia should have an adversarial relationship with the West, and, of course, that Russia should, um, in particular, control Ukraine. So in that environment, brand-new democracies, um, still trying to reform their economies and so on and so forth, Russia starts looking very nasty and down in Yugoslavia, there's the biggest war since 1945 going on. Um, that was a context in which they said, boy, um, we would be able to a lot, focus a lot more on, on democratization and so on and so forth if we had the security guarantees of NATO. Um, and so, you know, that was where it started. Um, mm. And for, from the perspective of NATO, um, expansion was a huge success, not in a military sense, but in the sense that all of those former Soviet states that were given NATO membership uh, became pretty well-functioning Western democracies um, and pretty well-functioning market economies. Now, there's been some backsliding, um, most notably in Hungary. Um, and, you know, there's some other cases. Romania is a case where, you know, there's still a fair amount of corruption and so on. Um, but overall, NATO enlargement in a political democratic sense I think most people saw as a smashing success. Um, however, and this gets back to security, however, that looked dangerous to Russia, right? And so the things, and this is the point that I'm trying to get at, and I'm sorry if I'm doing it in a long-winded way. The things that made the countries of Eastern Europe feel more safe made Russia feel like its interests were being impinged upon. Mm. Right? And that's a classic notion. We call it the security dilemma, the academics do. That, that there tends to be, the things that one side does to be more secure tend to make another side feel less secure. So similarly, when Russia insisted on things like Ukraine can't get into NATO because that makes us feel insecure, well, obviously that made Ukraine feel very insecure and made the country to its west feel less secure. And so that's the security problem. Um, yeah. It's difficult now, the, the, for everybody to feel secure at the same time, especially when one of the countries, in this case Russia, is sort of saying we want to revise borders. Mm-hmm. Now, the uh, in terms of you touched on the, the democratization of, of these yep. these uh, former st- Soviet states and uh, other states in the in the region. Um, what is uh, Putin's relationship with democracy? I mean, obviously, it's something he fears greatly. <laughs> yeah, so, so democracy becomes the other sort of uh, unintended driving, driving wedge between the West and Russia. Um, and this begins in the early 1990s, and here's one of the places where I think a lot of Westerners, including Americans, stayed way too optimistic way too long about Russia, which is the sign that, that, democratic, that democracy was not really taking root in Russia came very, very um, early, but I don't think a lot of people really noticed it until, you know, well into Putin's, or really wanted to accept it into well in, into Putin's reign. But the problem was this, was, it, was, um, it relates to the security issue, which is as those countries democratized, they wanted to join 
the um, European democratic institutions, and that meant NATO and the European Union. And so um, the democracy itself helped drive that wanting to join organizations, which, again, Russia saw as shutting us out economically and as potentially um, um, you know, reducing our influence in security terms. Um, but also, as Russia then became less democratic, it more or less became inevitable that there would be a line in Europe. Somewhere in Europe, right, there was going to be a line between what was democratic and what was non-democratic. And so Russia's veering back into autocracy um, itself sort of redivided Europe. It certainly wasn't intended to do so, right? The Russian government really just was trying to rule Russia the, the way they thought was best, but it created this difference. Right. And 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 Ukraine kind of got caught up in this. Well, which side are you going to be on? And this led Russia to interfere in Ukrainian elections, which um, offended the Russian, uh, the Ukrainians, of course. And the Ukrainians went out into the streets to to stop that. And it, of course, um, earned a lot of criticism from the West and made Russia seem aggressive. Um, Moreover, I think, and a lot of people have said this, is that because Putin claims that Russians and Ukrainians are so similar, he feared uh, of the sort of demonstration effect of democracy in Ukraine. If democracy succeeds in Ukraine and Russians are just like Ukrainians, well, then why not democracy in Russia, right? And Putin had been saying, no, it's, it's really not suitable here. We need this, this much more strong type of authoritarian ruler. And, and so, uh, so democratization then provided this fear for, for Putin, which pushed him to then intervene in, in Ukrainian politics, which, again, seemed to Ukraine and to others as being aggressive and, and made people, again, more focused on security, made the Ukrainians more uh, desiring to join NATO. Now, now some of the, uh, the propaganda that's coming out of Russia um, about this conflict, um, that uh, the Ukrainian government was corrupt, um, that um, we're fighting uh, Nazism and so forth. W- w- where does that all come from? Okay, so the corruption is easy first because um, there's a lot of corruption in Ukraine. Um, let's just, I, I, I just think we just need to lay that out there. Um, r- I mean, roughly, you know, when you look at the international corruption rankings, Ukraine is usually not quite as far down as Russia, but it's, you know, way far further down than any Ukrainian would like to see it. Um, so that's just a straight um, accusation, which I think most people um, would agree with. Ukraine, the Ukrainian government's been fairly corrupt. The 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 Nazi fascist thing is is very difficult to unravel. Um, and part of it is I think that if you look at a definition of fascism, right, Russia under Putin, especially with this war, begins to fit that definition. But it's been a an element of Soviet and Russian propaganda going back to World War II um, to equate Ukrainian nationalism with Nazism and fascism. And, um, and, and, and that's in part, I mean, the motivation is that Ukrainian nationalism, in the sense of wanting to break away from Russia, is very, very old. And in fact, when the Russians were pushing, uh, I'm sorry, when the Soviets, were pushing um, the the, Nazi, the the German army out of Ukraine at the end of World War II, um, there were a lot of Ukrainians, uh, especially out of the western part, who were hoping to carve out a Ukrainian state, as they had tried in 1918, and 19, from 1918 to 1920 after the Bolshevik Revolution. And so um, at the beginning of World War II and at the end of World War II, there were Ukrainians who thought they were going to get to finally carve out their state. And uh, among them, some of them collaborated with the Germans, hoping that that was going to lead to to stab. And so that's where this idea of Ukrainian Nazis comes from, is Mm. uh, there were some uh, Ukrainians who collaborated with with Germany um, as a way of trying to get um, free of Russia, right? You mentioned Finland earlier, right? Finland, technically during World War II, was at war with, you know, with the Allies because uh, Finland actually allied with, with Germany because they had they wanted they wanted to get free of of of, uh, of the Soviets, so you know war makes very makes very strange bedfellows. Um, 
the vast majority of Ukrainians in World War II um, fought in the in the Red Army or fought as partisans against the Germans, and of course, enormous number of Ukraine, Ukrainians died in World War II, either as a re- direct result of the combat or as civilian casualties or through the Holocaust. Um, but there is this kernel of truth, right, that there were some Ukrainians that collaborated with the Nazis. If you fast forward to 2014, um, some of the groups that participated in the overthrow of the pro-Russian leader of Ukraine in uh, 2014 were of a far-right nature. And amongst the far-right nature, a slice of them um, used what I would call fascist symbols um, and and were uh, neo-Nazis probably would be a, a fair word. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny you know slice of the people that were out there protesting. Um, but it was enough for uh, Putin and Russia to grab onto and sort of tar the entire Ukrainian democracy movement as being um, fascist. And then in 2014, when Russia invaded eastern Ukraine and the German army, I'm sorry, and so when uh, Russia invaded eastern Ukraine and the Ukrainian army was really uh, inept and, and unable to tackle them right away, um, a bunch of volunteer battalions formed up and went to fight the Russians in eastern Ukraine. Some of those groups grew out of some of these uh, far-right movements. And among some of those, there were some fascist symbols. So, so, you, so you get this, again, this tiny slice of the far-right. Um, and when I say tiny slice, far, na- uh, sort of far-right nationalist parties um, typically get less than 2% in Ukrainian elections. Um, but um, enough to grab onto for Putin and enough for people out in the West, um, if you don't know what's going on in Ukraine, to say, oh, there must be something to that. Well, there's a little teensy-weensy bit to that. But it would be roughly like looking at some of the stuff that happens in the far right in this country and saying the Republican Party is a fascist party or United States is a fascist country. Um, so it's uh, but but um, it's very effective. And the fact that I've now spent whatever five or ten minutes talking about it on your show shows how effective it is as propaganda. It's um, right. the Ukrainians have to continually try to deny this. I know this is a diff- difficult question, uh, yep. but but at what percentage would you say of the Russian population actually believe the propaganda that is produced by their own government? I, I think it depends on exactly which element of the propaganda. Uh, but I think, um, I should say, I think most Russians uh, agree with the idea that Ukraine and Russia really ought to be united in some way. Um, mm-hmm. I, that you know, Many Ukrainians and Russians have relatives you know, in each other's country. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, I think the, the stuff about Ukrainian no- uh, Nazis, I suspect, I'm going to just guess, you know. Uh, well, I won't even try to put numbers on it. I think a fair number of people do. Um, and probably many don't. Um, mm-hmm. But it's really hard to know because Russia is not a democracy and you can't really... Uh, there's been some public opinion polling there, but we don't know exactly how much to trust the numbers that come out of it. Mm-hmm. Now, um, part of the propaganda uh, that uh, Putin is using is that we are Russia is sort of liberating these uh, regions within Ukraine that want to be more Russian, want to ally themselves with Russian with russia um what what is going on there um, what, what are the regional conflicts are these regions that are have a majority or large population that are russian ethnically or what's happening there so according to the last soviet census about 22 percent of the population of the territory of ukraine was defined in their in their soviet passports as ethnically russian um People have made whole careers trying to study these these issues about national identity. So um, there's a relatively small percentage of of people who define themselves as Russian in Ukraine, but they do tend to be concentrated in the eastern regions um, and in Crimea. One of the clever things that Putin does is he talks about Russian speakers, right? Um, The idea that the Russian government is out there to protect all the Russian speakers in Ukraine, which is a far larger percentage of the Ukrainian population um, largely because of Soviet, you know, uh, and Tsarist era repression of the Ukrainian language. But the, the, the bigger point is there are many, many people in Ukraine who speak Russian, but identify as Ukrainian and don't want Ukraine to be part of Russia. 
right? It would be like saying that I, I'm an English speaker in California and I want to be moved from London because, we, because I speak English and that's called England, right? Um, mm. or, or that everybody who speaks Spanish in Latin America wants to be moved from Madrid. Um, that's just not the case. Um, so when Ukraine, we had one good picture of this, which was in Ukraine separated from the Soviet Union in 1991, they actually held a referendum. I think most people regard it as having been a, a free and fair referendum. Overall, uh, it was close to 80% in Ukraine as a whole voted to be independent. Those two uh, areas in eastern Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk, it was 78%. So, uh, so even the people who might have ethnically thought of themselves as Russian or spoke Russian, most of them um, um, wanted to be free. And I'll come back to that point. In Crimea, by the way, it was much lower, but it was still over 50% um, in Crimea, about 54% in Crimea voted to be independent of Russia. Now, I think many people, especially in eastern Ukraine, wanted Ukraine to be a separate state, but wanted it to be linked very close economically um, and politically with Russia so that they could continue, for example, to move freely back and forth across the border. Um, and that really became a, a challenge as, as time went on, as the economies split apart from one another. Um, a lot of, of people um, in eastern Ukraine found that that created a lot of hardship. Mm. And I think no. many people in Ukraine over the years would have said, um, would have said, we want to, we want to have, you know, join the European Union, but we also want to be trade with, with Russia. I think that probably the predominant position in Ukraine, at least until 2014, was let's try to have it both ways. Right. Now, I know this is going to sound kind of cynical, but um, a lot of people say whenever there's an outbreak, this is all about oil. Um, but uh, th there are there's petroleum concerns at risk here, aren't there, from um, at least the Russian perspective. What, to, to what extent is this conflict about oil or the selling of oil to the West or, or other issues about oil? Oh, yeah, I'm not... I don't think the conflict itself is about oil. Um, some have said that, that in particular because there may be some uh, natural gas or oil reserves in the, in the Black Sea around Ukraine, that what this really is all about is getting access to those uh, reserves. I tend not to – I just I don't see much evidence of that yet, um, either that there's that much in the way of reserves or that Russia is so short of oil that it would wage a, a war um, to get it. Um, the implications in terms of the global um, oil, uh, and I should say, shouldn't just say oil, um, it's, it's really different kinds of petroleum, and natural gas is, import, is as important as oil. The implications are massive, but I'm skeptical that that is what's driving it. Um, on the contrary, I think many people thought that this wouldn't happen, in part because of the huge energy interdependence between Russia and Western Europe, and in particular Germany. Um, Germany, as, I, as we talked about already, really sought to engage Russia rather than confronting it. And part of that engagement was that Germany gets about 40% of its natural gas from Russia. And, of course, a, um, a great deal of money flows back in the other um, direction. So to the extent that people focused on the energy trade, I think they thought that there was a reason why this wouldn't happen, because uh, Putin would not want to risk blowing up that incredibly lucrative relationship. Um, now, there are some people, there are some implications in this country, right, which is a lot of people have already said this is a reason to restart, reopen the, um, the Keystone Pipeline. This is a reason to issue a lot more drilling leases uh, for natural gas and so on and, and so forth. So, so there are those in the energy industry um, who potentially will benefit uh, from this as it increases the demand uh, for energy sources from other places. Big questions in Western Europe as well, I should say, about whether to, uh, in Germany in particular, whether to change their plans to close down their nuclear power plants um, and whether maybe to pull some coal-fired plants out of mothballs as a way of offsetting dependence on Russian natural gas. Now, I had read somewhere, <clears throat> I can't tell you where, I don't remember, and you can confirm whether you, you feel, think this is true or not, that the... Uh, the pipelines, whether they're gas or petroleum, that go from Russia to the West, some of them, or major part of them, go through Ukraine, and Ukraine was charging uh, Russia an exorbitant amount of, uh, to, for, for the rights to, to transfer their oil. 
does that ring a bell? Does that sound uh, yep. true? Yep. Um, yeah, so the pipelines. So um, these were pipelines that were built under the Soviets in the 1980s when they struck these uh, deals to export gas to, to Western Europe. Um, and it's interesting just to note that the United States government, this was mostly during the Reagan administration in the United States, the United States government was very opposed to this because they were worried about Western Europe becoming dependent on Russian gas. Those uh, pipelines, ironically, uh, the, the main one is known as the Druzhba pipeline, which means friendship. Um, they run through Ukraine, and it created um, two problems for Russia. Um, one of the things that Russia did really beginning in the early 90s, um, and I experienced this firsthand in Ukraine, was as a way of putting pressure on Ukraine to make concessions, they would, want, they would shut off the gas supply to Ukraine. Um, and of course, especially in the winter, things could get fairly cold, um, but it was also generating a lot of Ukraine's uh, uh, electricity. Um, however, because the pipelines that were used to supply Western Europe were the same ones that were being used to supply Ukraine, it was very difficult for them to um, um, cut off Ukraine without cutting off their very lucrative customers in Western Europe. Uh, mm. It was also um, a long-term subject about um, the price of, of gas transmission. Um, the bigger issue with the gas transmission, as far as I could tell, is that when one talks about corruption in Ukraine, the single biggest factor driving corruption in Ukraine was the revenue that Ukraine, the Ukrainian government was collecting uh, um, for that transshipment of Russian gas. I used to say that in a nutshell, Ukrainian politics is about who's going to be in the position to skim the money off uh, that's being generated uh, from those pipelines. Billions and billions of dollars. Um, was it so exorbitant that, that um, Russia w um, wanted to invade to control the, the pipelines? I don't think so. I think this invasion is going to cost dramatically more money um, mm -hmm. than those pipelines. And, and in any event, um, Russia was in, the, was in the very last stage of opening up another pipeline to Germany, which was going to make these... Um, pipelines going through Ukraine almost irrelevant. So the time to have conquered the pipelines would have been 20 years ago before they had built what's called Nord Stream, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. And I think one of the strange things about the timing of this is that if Putin had waited another six months or a year, Nord Stream 2 would be open, there would be gas flowing through it, um, and it, it would be actually easier then to cut off the gas to Ukraine. And of course, it would be much harder for Europe to close the, that Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So this is a bit of a mystery to me um, in terms of the, the gas trade and the timing is, is why he didn't wait until that second pipeline um, was opened. So the pipeline politics are immensely important, but I don't think they, uh, they're of a monetary value. Um, they're of a monetary value that would drive um, an invasion. I think the invasion is about this sense in Putin's mind um, that he has an historical mission to undo what was done in 1991 and to bring Ukraine back to Mother Russia. That, that's really what I think this is about. Um, now, um, I could be, I could be, I could be wrong, of course. Let's talk more about Putin <clears throat> just as a personality. Sure. Uh, certainly when it comes to um, strong men, Russia has, of course, a long history um, yep. and a history of having personality cults built around their leaders. Um, what, what makes him tick as a leader, and uh, why is his, his hold so strong uh, over Russia? <laughs> um, yeah, two, two related questions. Um, what makes him tick? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I, but I think he does have an approach um, to leadership, and it is an approach to the leadership that believes in strong, unified government, um, he, he used, you know, there's this phrase in Russian, the vertical, um, and it, means, it just means vertical. But the idea that when the person at the top says something, the people down below um, should, should do it, and that should be very reliable. It's sort of the Weberian notion of the state. Um, but what I think is interesting um, in the context of the post-Cold War situation is he increasingly came, uh, uh, came to see democracy not merely as something that threatened his rule in Russia, but that threatened Russia. Um, because he, he felt like democracy weakened Russia. And so when he slowly but surely over the, his terms in office uh, pushed back on the independence of the parliament, pushed back on the fairness of elections, pushed back in particularly on the free media, uh, 
it wasn't just that he was an authoritarian, which he, which he is, and those are his instincts, um, but it's that he saw all of those things, right, free elections, uh, a free media, and so on, as ways that Russia could be weakened and divided in the way that it was in the 90s. And so if Putin is popular in Russia, and he is popular in Russia, or at least was, um, he's popular because he, he seems to have undone the chaos uh, that, in, that uh, Russia experienced in the 1990s after the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, he brought more order to government. He fought a vicious but popular war in Chechnya that kept Chechnya from separating from Russia. And you mentioned oil earlier. Just by sheer luck, he came into office at a time when uh, oil and natural gas prices were at an historical low, um, 1999, 2000. And really for the first 10 or more years of his rule, um, the, the prices did, did nothing but grow. And so his, the amount of money he had to spend on doing things in the Russian economy just grew and grew and grew. And the amount of money he had to spend, basically, um, the, the, the size of the pie to be divvied up among these oligarchs who supported him just grew and grew and grew. So he believes in strong rule. He believes in strong leadership. He, he worries that democracy creates weakness. Um, I think otherwise he might be more favorable toward it. Um, and in particular, and we see this going all the way back to 1999, and, and we just didn't want to pay enough attention to it, he's willing to use violence uh, when all else fails. He mm. used violence um, to accomplish in Chechnya what Russia had not previously accomplished in Chechnya. He, uh, he poisoned opponents. He had opponents put in jail. He had opponents arrested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the end, he has shown himself to be um, unafraid, um, not only unafraid to use violence, but clearly it doesn't um, in injure his conscience in any ways. And if you look at some of these poisonings that have been done in various places, um, it's pretty clear. And so I don't think that violence in Ukraine was his first option. I think there's clear evidence that it wasn't. But when he doesn't get what he wants, he time and time again has resorted to violence whether on a very small scale and a single individual or on a very large scale. We have time for one more question. Um, okay. What, 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 is your, um, what, is your, what are your deepest concerns about this current conflict? <clears throat> yeah, my, my deepest concern is just for the suffering of the people of Ukraine that is just, I'm afraid, just beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 so many people have already died. So many more people are going to die. People are going to be displaced. Um, they're going to families are being scattered, you know, all over Europe. It's um, it's a it's a tragedy. It's sort of on. It's not quite on the scale yet, but it's a, a similar sort of tragedy that that accompanied um, World War II, with huge populations moving, people being displaced. Something similar to what we saw, you know, happening with with uh, Syria over the last uh, ten ten or more years. So um, that's my biggest fear. Um, I think there is, some people have talked about the fear of nuclear war. Um, that fear is certainly more today than it was three weeks ago. I personally still think we're a long way from that, but it's not something um, to be completely ignored. But, but before we get to anywhere near nuclear war, a lot of innocent people are going to suffer and die. Mm. And that's a shame. Because there's, yeah. in my mind, there's no good reason for it. Right. Um, uh, all the things that Putin wants... Um, He's, he's actually getting further away from. Um, this is not going to, you know, he can conquer Ukraine, but he cannot govern Ukraine. And um, actually, I think this is going to be terrible for Russia and actually even terrible for Putin's reputation. And then that's the real tragic sense is he's not even going to get out of it the things he hoped to get. Mm. All right. Well, we've been talking to Dr. Paul Danieri, the author of uh, Ukraine and Russia, From Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War. Um, this book um, is, as I said before, required reading for anyone seeking to better understand the, the current conflict before us. Um, and it's available on, uh, on Amazon and other uh, booksellers. And um, I want to thank you for making time for us this evening. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your, your expertise and your research.
Well, thanks. Thank you for your for your concern uh, about Ukraine and for for asking good questions and, and and giving me some time to really answer them. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. And this is Pastor S.J. Munson signing off.